and we are good to go. Great. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our first session of our spring 2021 book study of the assessment playbook for distance and blended learning by Doug Fisher, Nancy Fry, Vince Bustamante, and John Hattie. My name is Carrie McDaniel and I'm joined today by Misty Higgins and we are professional learning coordinators in the Office of Teaching and Learning, the Division of Program Standards at the Kentucky Department of Education. We are so excited to have so many of you joining us tonight from across the state, and we have a wide expanse of roles represented for this study, teachers, instructional specialists, school and district leaders, professors, and state and regional support staff, just to name a few. So it will be an energizing collaboration tonight, and we're so excited. We're going to encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat when prompted tonight to stay engaged and to help make your thinking visible. Just a few brief reminders about Zoom before we get started. If you'd like to see the comments from all of the participants and not just your own, you're going to want to open up that chat box. And that's typically on that right hand side of your screen. And this meeting will be recorded for you um, to access and watch later. So we will post that after tonight in Google Classroom in case you would like to uh, leave this study back in your school or district or if you'd like to rewatch parts of it. And then we really want to see your smiling faces, but if for some reason you're unable to keep your video on for bandwidth or surrounding distractions, we totally understand that um, if you need to turn your camera off, but we would ask that you would mute your microphone unless you are sharing with the group just to kind of avoid some of those background noises. And just as a reminder, all of the links to join our synchronous meetings, uh, the reading assignments, as well as the overview for each month of our study is listed here in the assessment playbook study plan, which you will find listed under general resources in your Google Classroom classwork tab. And then as a reminder, our next synchronous meeting together will be on Monday, February 22nd from 4.30 to 5.45 Eastern Standard Time. And the links to join each session can be accessed in your study plan under watch, read, and attend. We will also send you reminders much like we did today through Google Classroom prior to each monthly session. And then earlier today, you probably got some email notifications. All of the assignments were posted under that classwork tab by month. Since this study is self-paced, you can access these at any time. And here's where you will go in Google Classroom to access that study plan we mentioned earlier. And finally, we are so excited to have Dr. Douglas Fisher, co-author of the Distance Learning Playbook and the Assessment Playbook for Distance and Blended Learning, just to name a couple, here with us this evening. Dr. Fisher is a professor of educational leadership at San Diego State University and a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. He is a member of the California Reading Hall of Fame and was honored as an exemplary leader by the Conference on English mm -hmm. Leadership. Dr. Fisher has published numerous articles and professional texts on improving student achievement and teaching and learning. We are so excited to have such an influential leader in education with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Fisher. And Doug, Thank if you would like to see your slides, go ahead. Great. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your interest in this work. So I thought I would start with engaging tasks. How do we make sure students are engaged in the learning that we offer them? <clears throat> so if you remember the distance learning playbook, we had a, an engagement model that we're going to talk about that. But how do you gauge? student engagement in an online blended simultaneous hybrid high flex remote learning situation. How do you know your students are engaged? What do you look for? Let's type that in the chat. What do you look for in terms of engagement? <clears throat> I 
Paying attention. Thank you. Participation. Thinking visible. They're talking and they're writing. Interacting. Live meaning participation. Thinking. Cameras on. Typing in the chat. Asking questions. Responding to questions. Academic conversations. Using the chat. Hmm. Asking great questions. Active engagement in the materials, noise, movement, talking, eyes on the teacher, tracking that teacher, active learners, attending their Google Meets, having students do something every couple of minutes, three minutes, conversations. Awesome. When we survey students, by and large, they don't know these answers. Every time we change the format of school, we need to revisit engagement. So in blended learning, in hybrid learning, in simultaneous learning, in remote learning, what does it look like to engage? As we use this continuum of engagement, notice it's passive in the middle and active in both directions. Students can be actively disengaged. They can also be actively engaged. I really love this continuum. The research evidence suggests that every move to the right increases the amount of learning students do. Each move to the right improves the learning that they do. So if you have a student who's currently withdrawing, we gotta move them to participating and then eventually to investing and eventually to driving. But notice in driving the assessment connection. Students begin to self-assess. They start to notice their own progress in their own learning. So what a lot of teachers are doing right now, a lot of teachers are asking students to talk about and record what does an engagement look like in our class. Every time we change the format of school, we revisit this. So this is Sarah's class and with her fourth graders, she created Google Slides and she had them right in there. What does it look like? I'm gonna go fast because you can do this with your own students. This is what it looks like in our class when we are disrupting learning. This is what it looks like in our class when we are avoiding learning. This is what it looks like in our class when we are withdrawing from our learning, like thinking about Fortnite during class. <clears throat> this is what it looks like in our class when we're participating. This is what it looks like when we're investing. And this is what it looks like when we're driving our own learning. And that's where we want to get students. Can we get them driving their learning and self-assessing where they are taking the tools we give them and determining where they are in that learning journey? And in Sarah's class, every day, every lesson, she says to her students, what was your level of engagement today? And give me two pieces of evidence. She did this in September and you, you can see it's a noticeable difference. Students know what it means to engage. I talked to her in December and she said, the parents of the students in her class are now using this language with their kids. They don't say anymore, what did you do today? Instead they say, what goals did you have today? What feedback did you ask for the teacher? What questions did you ask in class? And when Sarah has a student who's more on the withdrawing side and she contacts the family, they understand the language. Today, your child was withdrawing. How do we get your student, your child back into participating and investing? Great conversations. We should do this every time we change the format of school so students know clearly what we're looking for. Now, one of the ways to increase that engagement slash participation are these universal responses, these micro assessments that propel learning forward. Universal responses are these simultaneous replies from everybody rather than isolated answers from students. We say as a general rule, less would be awesome. No more than 10 minutes will go by without a universal response. That every 10 minutes, students have a response opportunity they are invited back into the learning through a response at least every 10 minutes. <clears throat> but before I go into too many examples, I wanna comment about wait time. I think by and large, we forgot about wait time when we started pandemic teaching because we were teaching the little empty squares. We were not seeing a lot of faces. And so what happened is we just went for it straight through and we were seeing very, very little wait time. Here's an infographic on wait time that I really like. In the chat, what is jumping out to you from this infographic? What are you noticing? Like what's speaking to you 
and the work you do on this infographic. <clears throat> Courage, thank you. Yes, risk-taking, courage, effort. They have to listen, <clears throat> building up the courage. Processing time. I wish the researchers hadn't called this wait time. I wish they called it thinking time or processing time, but it's called wait, wait time in the research. Listening to respond, processing time. It's not always the same for different students that have different needs. They may have to translate. It takes time, I like that. It takes time to think deeply about something. They need confidence. And wait time too, I think is really cool. After students answer, you wait a little bit to see if they'll extend their response. Listening skills, yep. Wait times are longer in distance learning, we know that. Audio delays, thinking time, composing time, unmuting time, all, all of that contributes to the challenge of wait time. <clears throat> it's all real. In last August, we created what we called waterfall chat. I think we just made this up in August. <clears throat> it's now called a lot of things around the country, but we started this in August. And essentially the idea is this, students type in a response, but they don't hit send, they don't return. So no one can see their response until there's a simultaneous request from the teacher. We say waterfall because in physical school, we said waterfall, so it's that connection. So we asked students to type things in the chat but not hit send until we tell them. So we're gonna practice waterfall if you haven't done this before. So I'm gonna ask you a question, I'll give you some thinking time, some typing time, but try not to hit return. Try not to send your response. Don't let anybody see it if you can avoid it. All right, here's my question. If you could compare metaphorically the last two weeks of distance, remote, blended learning to an amusement park ride. So Dollywood or Disneyland or Six Flags or County Fair or whatever. Which amusement park ride have you been on for the last two weeks of distance learning? So thinking, typing, but try not to hit return. Try not to let us see your answer. And waterfall, merry-go-rounds, tower of terror, <laughs> zipper, <laughs> bumper cars, moonshot, <laughs> log flume, skyfall, <laughs> the beast, <laughs> steel vengeance. Super fun. I love watching all of these. <laughs> now your job. Now your job is to go back, do a chat review, scroll back up, find an answer that made you laugh or resonated with you or you connected with, copy that person's answer, paste it in the chat, make a dash mark and tell us why. There's my example in there. This is not waterfall, this is live chat, chat review. Scroll back up, find an answer, copy paste, dash mark. Why is that one making you laugh, resonating, connecting, et cetera. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Going in circles, not getting anywhere. <laughs> and you try to control the spinning. <laughs> yeah, scares you. Yep. Makes your head hurt. <laughs> Ups and downs. It's so accurate. Yep. So much going on at once. I never write it. <laughs> Need more arms. Mm hmm. Awesome. A vivid memory for the family. Thank you. Sometimes you feel like you're going in circles. Awesome. <clears throat> if you have not done waterfall chat or chat review, if this is new for you, could you come on voice video and tell us how you felt about this as a learner? Anybody willing to come on voice video and tell us 
how you felt about these two as a learner. Um, I actually really enjoyed this. I've, I've never done it. Uh, I, I, I'm a math teacher in Maru County and I think that even in, in, in math, I could really have some fun with this and some of my Google Meets right now. Um, I'm quarantined because I got COVID and I've got a few more days left to quarantine before I can get back in the school. But I think it'd be entertaining to see how the students react to waiting to see everybody's answer versus just letting one person answer all the questions. So I think it's going to be really fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And take care of yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Tina and uh, I work with the special needs and I think this will be really interesting for them to try. We'd never done this before, but this gives them a chance to maybe come up with different ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Students tell us it feels very safe because their answer is in with other people's answer. Anyone else want to comment on this? <clears throat> Did all of your internet connections just crash? I think that. I'll go ahead and share. Yes. Sorry. It happened. Uh, oh, I'm excited. Go ahead, Jessica. OK. Um, I teach fourth grade, all content areas. Uh, we've done the waterfall chats, which my kids love. But uh, when I was doing the chat review, I was like, bingo, because I'm really big on that reflection time and like the kids adding to each other's thinking. So I don't know why I never thought of that. I love it. So we're going to try that next. <laughs> Thank you. I think Misty, you are next. And I was going to say something similar to Jessica, because not only are you putting your idea in, but on that chat review, you're seeing ideas of others. And sometimes it's reiterating like, oh, they had the same thoughts that I did. But here are some new ideas as well, just to continue to build their own confidence. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And students say that. And then now students are writing in the chat, how come nobody picked mine? Mine was good. And then they start another whole chat going, it's hysterical to watch. Now I waited for it and it happened. Two people spoke at the same time and then it became awkward. No, you go, no, you go, it's okay. No, it's not that important. Students do this all the time. And over time, if they get embarrassed by, the, by will, being willing to share, they stop sharing. They stop coming on voice video because they don't want that to happen. Just what happened now. There is a solution to this. You teach them radio talk. They say your name first and then their name. Mr. Fisher, Arif. Yes, Arif, go. Mr. Fisher, Delasia. Yes, Delasia, go. Mr. Fisher, Anthony. Yes, Anthony, go. Mr. Fisher, Geo. Yes, Geo, go. And if they all five talk at the same time, they've only said my name and then their name. They're not talking. There's no more apologizing. There's no more, I'm sorry. No, you go, no, you go. You. I pick based on the names I heard. It will completely change the dynamic if you teach your students to say your name first and then their name. I know you can have them use the hand raise and other things like that, but then you call on them and there's this delay with the unmuting. Some of them start talking before they've unmuted. So you've missed part of it. Sometimes you say to a student, you're still on mute. You have to unmute. And what do they say when they come in? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yes, we know. We just told you you were on mute. We know that. So radio talk will change the dynamic of your class and students will be less embarrassed because they're not talking over each other and they get it. They understand how to do it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You can also use hand signals. That works as well. Um, I've convinced our students, I work at high school, <clears throat> our students leave their cameras on, but they point them to the ceiling. I don't care one thing about looking at ceilings. I say to the students all the time, I have the best class of ceiling fans that I have ever taught in my entire career. Your ceiling fans are awesome. Diverse and awesome ceiling fans. You're amazing. And every once in a while I say, your ceiling fans are all spinning at different speeds. I'm getting a little seasick. Could you put your face in for a second so I don't throw up on my computer? And they laugh at me and they come in. I don't care if their cameras are at the ceiling, because if I ask them for hand signals, they can put their hand in and I get a response from them. And I'm totally good with that, if that's what it takes. Early in the pandemic, we did not see a lot of response cards. Now we see them every day. Different grade levels, 
different content areas, response cards are very common. So let's look at a first grade class. Oh, I should say this. When we watch videos together, live chat. That means chat in real time. If there are things you notice in, that the teacher is doing, things that you're appreciating, put it in the chat, name the things you're seeing. The word is <clears throat> Matt. Matt. What is the beginning, <clears throat> the middle, and the ending sounds in Matt? Matt. Thank you, Brahim. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Dariana. Thank you, Dominic. Matt. What do you hear? Matt. You can always stretch the word. Matt. Here we go. Matt. Matt. Good. Let Super cool. Do you think learning is occurring? I do. I think those kids are learning. They're with their teacher. They're processing. They are learning. And if you ever doubted that movement and learning weren't connected, did you see all the wiggles that were happening? I don't see that very much when I teach ninth graders, but boy, every elementary video I watch, they're moving all over. Super cool. And they're allowed to now because at physical school, they weren't as moving as much. Um, <clears throat> Response cards are associated with higher achievement on tests and quizzes, more participation, less problematic behavior. They've been around for decades, decades of studies on this, and yet we don't always see them being used, physical school or remote. You can get pre-printed ones. This was from Amazon, a local district in our town bought this for everybody. Yes, clickers also can work. You can have all kinds of ways of doing this. This is what I do. In the before times, we used to have um, uh, Brazilian steakhouses. You might remember that in before. And so at the Brazilian steakhouse, if you don't remember, they give you a little coin and green side means bring me meat, red means give me a break. And so we had all these old CDD and DV cases laying around that nobody was using. So we put green and red paper in them, gave them out to students. If they lose them, whatever, have more of them. There are piles of these around that nobody's using. And so we asked students, just hold up the card. They can even write on them. If they're sure of their answer, they write it on the green side. Of course, it's on the plastic. If they're not sure of their answer, they write it on the red side and they just hold it up. Sometimes I just say, okay, if you're thinking this, hold up the green. If you're thinking that, hold up the red. And I might not see their face, but boy, that comes in right away. It's just one more way to get a response. And as you see in the chat, dry erase boards, awesome. Personal whiteboards, whether they're purchased from teacher store or from the hardware store, they let you see the writing more clearly. They really show up and they let you see the writing. Here's another example. Uh, so there are more kids in the class, but their parents didn't sign consent. These are the only kids whose parents signed consent. But again, something to watch and think about. There were four green bugs and two yellow bugs. How many bugs are there all together? <clears throat> Don't show me yet. Keep your whiteboards down. I want a picture and a number sentence. I'll repeat it one more time. There were four green bugs and two yellow bugs. How many bugs are there all together? I'm looking for a number sentence, a picture, and the sum. I see a couple thumbs up. That means you're ready. One two, three, show me. Hold it still so I can take my picture. All right, perfect, thank you. Go ahead and put it down. And erase, good work, first graders. And I recognize when cameras are off, it's a challenge, I recognize that. And our district policy here is you cannot require cameras on. You can ask students to turn them on. You can tell them why it's important for them to turn it on. You can act like they're gonna turn them on, but you can't require it. 
So in November, last November, we started this new thing. We act like students are gonna turn on their cameras and we say to them, let's turn our cameras on and I wanna see your work in three, two, one. Most of them do. And often after they show the work, they turn it back off. So here's an example of that. Okay, did I miss up? All right, now this is what I want all of us to do. You are going to turn your camera on and you're going to show me your work on the count of three. Okay, so camera's on. Emmanuel, eh, Evelyn, prendan sus cámaras y me van a enseñar su trabajo. No tienen que enseñar su cara si no quieren, está bien. Lo único que necesito es ver que hicieron el trabajo. All right, everybody. So, one, two, three. Okay, I'm missing some people. I'm missing some people. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. All right, thanks. You may put your whiteboard down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, excellent. Um, now, please send your work to Teams. If you haven't done so, all right, thank you. Thank you. Got everybody, thank you. Appreciate that. I was missing a couple of people, but it's okay. All right, now I want volunteers. Who would like to present? Who would like to talk about your work and be proud about it and hopefully help other tigers? understand the math. Luis, thank you so much. I appreciate your help. So let me find. Okay, let's see. Luis Alcala, mm, here you are. Awesome. All right, Luis, go. Um, so what I did is that, um... So if you haven't seen this, literally, Monica is having her students hold up the paper that they are, their dry erase boards, whatever they worked on, take a screenshot and send her the picture in the chat function. This is very common here. We do this all the time. I can show videos of four and five-year-olds doing it and high school kids in calculus doing it. They hold up their picture, their work, they take the screenshot and they transfer it to their teacher. And in this case, she asked students to volunteer to talk about their own work. We do not require their faces on, but we do want them to, we do want to see their work. This screenshot has been just a powerful way to have work in real time. And they just push the file button and they transfer it. They all know how to do it. It is very simple. It really works uh, to have students processing in real time, showing us in real time. Now, people always ask about this student here because Ms. Lacona says, I got everybody, but we never see her. That's because she's a sixth grader. She's a peer tutor in her cross-age tutoring time, and she will be in breakout rooms with work, working with um, kids in this class. So we do use a lot of peer tutors here, cross-age tutors. That is very common. Parents like it, gives their kids more things to do. So if you haven't thought about peer tutors, maybe give that some thought. We can also use polls. Polls are another way to invite students in uh, to participate, to have a universal response. What we see now today is more what we call poll repoll. So teacher launches the poll, students choose their answer. We show the results, we display the results. Then we talk about it. We might go to a breakout room. We might stay in the main room. We might do it in the chat, but we talk about the results of the poll. Then the teacher clears that poll and relaunches the same poll again. And then students compare what happened from the first time to the second time. How did the thinking change? How did it, how did it move around? 
why? So poll repoll has become a very common way of engaging learners. So some of you know this system, Kahoot, very popular, very easy to use, but look in the middle, average answer time, 3.2 seconds. <clears throat> Kahoot incentivizes how fast you answer and accuracy, but you get a lot of points for how fast you answer. Thankfully, Kahoot now allows you to turn off the speed incentive and focus only on accuracy. I encourage you to do that. Learning is not about how fast you can do it. Learning is about thinking and being, and really thinking like, is this the right answer? I'm being, some, being a little reflective and being accurate. So I appreciate that Kahoot did this for us. So it's not a game show. We're not trying to answer really fast. We're trying to think and, and get it as correct as we can. So if you, if you have Kahoot and you use it, consider turning off the speed function. <clears throat> One of my favorite ways to assess learning is teach back. It's amazing. There's a whole playlist in the, in the, thing, in the book you're reading on for book club on teach back. Honestly, it started because we did not have enough online content. And I was working with a district in Northern California and I said, we don't have enough stuff for kids to do. We're gonna run out of time. There's not enough content. So we decided we would call it Teach Back Tuesday. And on Tuesdays, kids could teach their siblings, their parents, extended family, the class, whomever. But if the Teach Back, so it, it would fill time for content. Well, now it's become one of our major assessments. When students teach back, you get a sense of what's stuck and where the misconceptions are. As an example of, of an example of teach back, retelling is one of them, how we think about it. We have to build assessment rubrics. So here's a rubric for retelling for informational text. Of course, students need to see models and examples. And then it's the assessment opportunity. So this is going to be retelling of a story about racial rights. Hey, okay, so it starts with a kid in his room. His name is Mason Stone. He, I meant Mason Steele. He, he's a smart, smart boy. He went, he, he was is writing in his room when his father called for his name. He's like, Mason Steel, Mason. <laughs> and, and then he asked his wife, Where, where's that boy? Then he said, writing, writing his books, dear. And then he, and then Mason- I know he's super wiggly, but look at all the things you know. Can you assess content knowledge? Can you assess oral language? Can you assess organization? I mean, the things that you think about just watching this two minute clip of what this student knows from that retell of that content. So let's not neglect this. A retelling has been around for decades. We know about their impact, but you know, if you have 30 students and they each retell two minutes, that's 60 minutes plus transitions. So we never did this in physical school because we would run out of time. But on something like Flipgrid, it's super simple or Seesaw or whatever video recording systems you use, it's super simple to have students do these retellings. When we get a chance to teach others, it's an opportunity to learn again. Because that's, then that's why we decided to do this on Tuesdays. Now we do it across the, across the board. But the whole idea was it's valuable learning time for students if they get to teach someone else. Here's another example. Hello class. Mm. So we are going to compare numbers and the numbers we are comparing are 436,425 and 450,123. So the bigger one would be this one because the alligator would want to eat it. Hmm. The reason why the alligator would want to eat this number is because you easily see the four and then the four. They're equal. Hmm. But you would go to the next one and there's a three. 
and then there's a five. Five and three are not equal. So you would go, you would go to the one that's bigger, and you would put the alligator, and then you would circle it. Mm -hmm. And if you ever have another problem like this, and these are staying equal but the last one isn't, then you have found your answer of which one's bigger. So thank you so much for watching how to compare a number. Uh, and if you know if you know Flipgrid, the next one comes up, the next one comes up, the next one comes up, and they're super simple for you to think about what's stuck. And what do I need to do next for this learner? I, I love TeachBack. I think it's super cool. <clears throat> As part of TeachBack, we started uh, revisiting the clarity questions that we wrote years ago. What am I learning today? Why am I learning this? And how will I know that I learned it? Three questions that I think should drive all of our interactions with students. They should always know what they're learning. They should always know the relevance of that learning. And they should know what success in learning looks like. So last semester, we started asking students to record privately for their teacher only a teach back of what they learned just for their teacher and answer these three questions in their video. Today in stats class, we are talking about an interesting topic about purpose, about the purpose of random assignments and the importance of it, which is to make each assignment or group equal and to eliminate biases. I learned it because I know that I can use it in the future or I can maybe even use it now already um, so that when, I, when it comes to, to getting to know or, or seeing a random experiment, I won't get fooled by it and know if everything's equal or, or correct or um, if I'm ever going to make a random experiment myself, I can, um, I, I can or I will know what to incorporate. I, I know I have learned this because I can explain to you what, what I'm learning in stats and um, the purpose of it and how we can use it in our life. Uh, we can use it outside of school, not just in stats class. And that's it. And these videos have become so powerful. For middle school and high school, we ask them to do it twice a week. They know their assigned day. So we don't get 200 videos in a day. We get some videos every day as an exit slip. Did my content stick? Do my students see relevance? And do they know what success of learning looks like? It, and it's, it, these videos are so powerful. Earlier, I made the claim that we should have students having more self-assessment. And that was when we were talking about engagement. I don't want to be the decider of students learning anymore. I don't want to be the arbiter of their learning. I want students to self-assess and I would like my role to be the validator and the challenger. I want to validate your learning here and challenge your learning there. I don't want students to say, she's easy, she's hard, she doesn't like me. I don't want that anymore. I want students to use self-assessments and then us to say, this is where I agree with you. This is where I want to challenge you based on the evidence you have so far. <clears throat> and we can start small. Build regular habits for students to self-assess. Start small. Rate the quality of your breakout room. Get used to self-assessing. For younger kids, rate the quality of your partner conversation. And by the way, people still do make posters and take pictures of them because these are very appealing rather than a PowerPoint slide. So in elementary, we still see a lot of this here in San Diego. So the poster paper, take a picture because then the students still feel like, oh, it's, it's not in another PowerPoint. <clears throat> we can have students at a weekly level. So here's what we're gonna learn. Here's what success looks like. Rate yourself before. On Monday, rate yourself. Where are you at with this learning? At the end of the week, where are you at with your learning? We can use single point rubrics to have students. What are your grow opportunities and what your glow opportunities? Again, self-assessing. Where am I at in my learning? Writing, same thing. Can I, where is the area that needs work? And what, where am I really strong? <clears throat> 
And by the way, this saves a lot of time. Student writing, again, not everything needs to be digitized. Students can still write on paper and take pictures. But look at the teacher's comments. Saved a lot of time. And that's not the reason we do it. The reason we do it is because students should own their assessment data. We serve as a reflection. I agree with you or I'm going to challenge you. Get students to use the tools to guide their own thinking and learning. I think this is my favorite. I think we made this up in June. I couldn't find anywhere else on the internet. I've searched the internet. I think we made this up in June. So we put a success criterion at the top. In this column, you list all the things you know. And in this column, you list all the ways you can show the things you know. I really like this. I think it's very cool. Self-assess. What do you know? How could you show it? <clears throat> Here's an example. <clears throat> Here's another example from anatomy and physiology, more narrative version. And here's one in history. And students are using these tools to figure out what I know and how I can show, or as this student changed it, how I can prove it. And boy, what a lifelong skill that would be to know what you know and show how I can show what I know. And as students self-assess, our role becomes more to evaluate. Do I agree with you? Do I disagree with you? What evidence are you putting together? Where are you not? Where are you at? What am I thinking about? So in this area, we have a couple of things we've been talking more about. The first is performance assessment. How do we move to more of a performance assessment mindset? So if students are doing a performance, they're self-assessing or their peers are assessing, and then we validate or we challenge. And so we're seeing all kinds of things like presentations, debates, Socratic seminars, et cetera. Here's an example, Ms. Ortega, hot seat. Every Friday, her students are in the hot seat. They don't know which question they're going to get, but they know they're gonna get one. And in fact, students often submit hot seat questions. So today, you're going to show what you know <clears throat> about the poem, The Girl Who Thought in Pictures. How will you show what you know? You will be in the hot seat today. You will take on the role as if you were Dr. Temple Grandin and you will answer interview questions as if you were her talking about her life. So today you are in the hot seat. Thank you for joining the hot seat with us again, Dr. Temple Grandin. Your interview question for today is, Tell us what life was like for you as a young child. It was difficult because I was I was trying to do my work. I was I was I was I was I was uh, only living on the man's world with, because I was a scientist and and I was the and I was the only one that was a girl and I was a scientist and no one took me serious. But I'm now now look where I am. I'm I'm in I'm famous now. Now that I have all the work I have I done, and now this is where I go for my work. Thank you, Doctor Temple Grandin. What words and phrases come to your mind as you heard him respond? to the hot seat question. Some people don't like that she calls it hot seat, but it's, that strategy has been around a long time. It's based on some old TV show. I don't remember what it was. But in the chat, what words or phrases come to your mind as you heard him perspective taking? Thank you. What else comes to mind? Mm, thank you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Awesome. <clears throat> Awesome. Perspective, point of view, empathy, all evidence from the text, <clears throat> relaying information. There's evidence of his learning. He understands that text in that individual's life. Yeah. Super awesome. I really, really like that hot seat. I think that's really fun to play. We're seeing a lot more podcasts now. 
a lot more podcasts. Like I watched a kindergarten podcast of kindergarten, I listened to Nancy showed it to me. Uh, there's images that pop up. So yeah, it's a video cast, but images pop up and you hear kindergartners voices and they're telling stories. It's hysterical. They are so funny. Um, not all the parents have signed consent yet, so I don't have that one to show you. I have this middle school one, an immigration project. This is a, a teacher in Canada, middle school teacher. The students, uh, different groups have different plays. Um, this group organized there about theirs on the country of origin. The art class at the middle school created a bunch of art and different student groups could choose the art from the art class. The music program built a whole bunch of songs that they could use. So different groups could select the songs for their own podcast. Different services, <laughs> I can just open <clears throat> up. So this group chose this piece of art and that song that you're hearing, that music that you're hearing for theirs. And theirs is organized by country of origin. In Canada, in, in middle school, they have to learn about immigration policies and versus refugee. There's a whole curriculum that's required. And so the, in distance learning, the teacher decided to do it this way rather than just study policies. So here's part of the interview. Just uh, regular interviews with uh, parents or family. Processing or when we get to Canada? Um, yeah, kind of like the processes, processing. Uh, it's it took a very long time. It's not that it's it's not difficult. And that's it. And they're pretty cool. I think these podcasts are pretty cool. Um, and there's just all kind of anchor FI. There's all kinds of ways of doing this. And students are really enjoying putting together podcasts. The last one I'll put together is uh, in this area around performance is a public speech. So students can still give speeches just like they did before, give their public speech. This assignment was a PSA. What public service announcement do you need? I chose this one because I hope it also, in addition to being an example of a student giving a speech, I hope it also speaks a little to your heart. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abigail Tabanda. In the beginning of this year, on January 26, a beloved NBA legend, Kobe Bryant, passed away. <clears throat> Along with eight other passengers, one being his daughter, the helicopter they were using to travel to a sports tournament was met with devastatingly heavy That's fog amazing. that disrupted the pilot's ability to fly the helicopter. That day, parents lost their children. People lost their siblings. Many lost their friends, colleagues, and why do I bring up this awful moment that foreshadowed the rest of our chaotic year? To remind us that life is short and could be taken away at any given moment. Most importantly, to encourage us to talk to our loved ones. The world has been in a state of chaos for the past eight months. Many are coming to the right realization that life is short. When something like a virus is being spread, people feel that's the time to prioritize family. Prioritizing family shouldn't be done when it's most convenient. The world we live in is unpredictable. It saddens me to say, but accidents happen every day. People are dying every day. Be sure that within your homes, in case of an emergency, you have the contact information of those dearest to you. Be sure that your family's insurance information is ready and available. Most importantly, be updated and aware of the situations around you. The time to tell those around you, I love you, is now. The time to tell them how much you appreciate them is now. Don't let your pride push away your opportunity to show affection to your parents. And don't let fights with your siblings be the last conversation you have with them. This has been a public service announcement. Thank you. And I just, every time I watch it, I say, wow. The advice from a 17 year old, don't let your pride get in the way of showing affection to your parents. The time to tell the people you love that you love them is now. I just, I just love that this is with her assignment and her public service announcement. It's just, yeah, it is such a wise and thoughtful and then delivered beautifully. Uh, just, just beautiful. I just think that is so, so cool. I learned a new word a few months ago, well, five or six months ago. Uh, Nancy and I were on a search for something. We were disagreeing about something. 
and I ran across this ipsative assessment. Never heard of it before in my life. So impress your friends tomorrow with this idea of ipsative, where you compare a student's per present performance, their current performance, to their own past performance. I think as we try to figure out how to recover learning and accelerate learning, this is going to be a major form of assessment we should use. Compare the student to the student back in time. And like athletes, set a PR, make a personal best. Stop comparing everybody to everybody else. Where are you now? What's your next? What's your next? What's your next? I really like this form of assessment. I think this is a very powerful way that we can address some of the inequities, some of the trauma and the learning needs that our students have. Here's a word card I found on the internet. <clears throat> which is pretty cool. I really like this form of assessment. We're doing a lot more of this. As an example, formative practice tests, which have been around for decades, good, good effect size studies, good research on them. But the evidence is very few people actually use practice tests, formative practice testing. The reason is every time we give an assessment in class, that's fewer minutes for instruction. But in distance learning, we can have formative practice testing occur in an asynchronous environment. So what do we know? We know that a year after instruction, students who got a formative practice test outperform students who did not. One year later, they still perform better. <clears throat> the evidence is that feedback, or sorry, that they are useful in both elementary and secondary. Good research on both. That feedback paired with practice enhances learning. That's, I mean, this is, of course, they see their errors and they're more likely to take the feedback. And the value seems to be in students reflecting on their own results. So we don't score grade practice tests. We score or evaluate their analysis of their practice test. We don't care what they got right or wrong. What we care about is their analysis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh huh. Focus on growth. Yes, and and do more. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pe beat their personal best. Yes. So on the practice test, we ask them, "What are the complex things you got right? What are the complex things you got wrong? What are the foundational things you got right? Foundational things you got wrong? What did you do well?" And by the way, if you know the study skills research. Students tend to study things they've already learned. It's more comfortable. I'm doing my studying, mom. I'm working really hard, mom. But they're studying things they've already learned. What do I need to practice versus what do I need my teacher to still teach me? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And we score these by, are they accurate? Do they, do they actually do this? They completed it and yes. Here are the things they got right. Here's the things they got wrong. Did they decide what they need to practice on, et cetera. Now at our school, we've added a new box on this in the last few weeks. What can I teach another person? So that they are at the level of expertise. <clears throat> and we look at it as a narrative and there's, a, there's a, a quick checklist. And if you do it, you get the score. It doesn't matter how many items you got right or wrong on the practice test. What matters to us is your analysis of it. Another example of more of an ipsative approach, interactive videos have been around uh, their high yield effect for distance learning, getting students to interact with video content. It works, but we were using it as a one shot. They would go through the video and they would do the, the, you know, the questions and they would get that score. And we changed it to be more ipsative, your personal best. You can watch these videos over again, always aiming to get your personal best. This system happens to be play posit Although you could use Edpuzzle, you could use Nearpod. There are other systems to use. <clears throat> Robber barons. Who were the richest tycoons in America? In the late 19th century and early 20th century, there were Americans who made vast amounts of wealth. These tycoons gained the derogatory nickname robber barons because of the questionable methods they used to acquire their fortunes and build their vast industrial empire. Pops up a question. The video won't play again until you answer. So I did a screenshot so I could fast forward because it won't do that. 
You can use open-ended questions. You can use closed questions. There's all kinds of tools, but we allow students to watch these over and over again to get the score they want. <clears throat> the third kind of evaluation we call confirmative assessment. How are you confirming students' competence or what's next for them? We do see, as teachers talk about, a fair amount of cheating. We hear that a lot. Students are cheating. Now, I, I still, I still think about this a lot. Like if they're Googling things and they know how to find good information versus bad information on the internet, that's still a skill to develop. I mean, that's a good skill because a lot of bad information is on the internet. If you haven't seen it, there are literally thousands of TikTok videos on how to cheat on just about any kind of test the teachers have come up with. I mean, thousands of TikTok videos. We also see parents doing over helping, parents telling kids the answers, parents doing the work for the kid, not helpful, but it is happening. Here's a tweet. Mm -hmm. And just for a clarification, I doubt the teacher said, you are mom is right. I bet the teacher said, your mom is right. I think that's super funny. And a thousand people liked it <laughs> about it at the time it was out. Parents are confessing over helping. So the question is, how dishonest are students? How dishonest are they? So they did some studies starting in college, replicated in high school and middle school. If you have an honor code, a public honor code, just having an honor code reduces dishonest behavior. If you have an honor code and a public commitment ceremony, it reduces cheating dishonest behavior even more. But if you have an honor code and a public commitment ceremony and on every test, you ask students about the honor code, it reduces cheating on average by 50%. Here's an example. What does it mean to you not to cheat on a math test? What standards do you set for yourself? It means not to look at other places but your brain for the answer. Did you live up to the standards you set for yourself on question one? Is there anything you did that you think could have been considered shady by someone else? Yes, I did it by myself and I'm actually really proud because I tried really hard and I didn't use photo math once. I did use a calculator to do number five just to divide, but that was all. We've been doing this for a couple months now. The students are so honest. They tell us, here's how I got it done. I don't wanna go to sleep at night because I, you know, thinking I was a cheater. When we activate their thinking about who they want to be, not what they want to be, who they want to be, they are very, very honest. Here's my favorite assessment that I've seen in the pandemic. Math teacher said to the students, lucky you, the test is completely finished. All the answers are there. All the work is shown. Lucky you, it's done. Here it is. It's your test, completely done. Your job is to figure out if the person did it, did it right or not, and if not, what caused the error. You can Google the answers. The answers are already there. What caused the error, not what the error is. Actually moving students into error analysis, actually moving students into thinking about what causes errors. I think this is an awesome assessment. I think this is a fantastic piece about how we invite students into learning. So I'm gonna pause there. I'm hoping some of you are thinking, I'm taking something with me, I'm, I'm interested. Anybody really willing to come on and talk about what is what's a takeaway, uh, something you're, you're thinking about, you're, you're planning to use? Anyone related to talk about the best thing you've learned today? <clears throat> I like the honor code. Oh, Mr. Fisher, Shauna Smith. Good job. Not a problem. I heard you. Thank you, Shauna. And yes, I like the honor code idea. I had seen that with the hour preview, um, little seminar webinar you had given a, online a few months ago. Um, we do a lot with our, we call it our alpha code, which is our 
behavior code every day. And I think the honor code would fuse well with it. And um, I just think that even um, raises our expectations for students to um, be more honest and to self-reflect. And like you said, they're so honest and they want to be that good person. I just feel like that would be a great thing for the school community. Appreciate that. Thank you, Shauna. Mr. Fisher, Josh Jackson here. Hi, Josh. Hi. Um, hey, as a principal, um, I uh, one of the things is my instructional coach and I, uh, Mrs. Gruen, uh, were always uh, talking about uh, how we can support our teachers uh, with the blended learning environment that uh, all of us have been challenged with uh, this past year. And I think the one thing that uh, the biggest takeaway that I have as a principal is the, um, the tools to take back, but the, the feedback I can give my teachers. And the biggest thing is, is that we have been working with our teachers on giving our students quality specific feedback uh, throughout uh, the duration, whether they be a hybrid student or a 100% virtual student. Uh, I love the point that you made uh, was that it really got me thinking about going in on the form of assessments and going through and actually uh, analyzing the student's reflection piece um, and, and kind of flipping that a little bit and, and taking our school and looking at as our next step uh, as we uh, uh, grow in the form of assessment piece and how we give specific feedback to our teachers. So I think that that was a huge takeaway for me. And I think the other thing which looks simple but is in depth is uh, having our students show, you know, this is what I know and this is how I can show what I know. I think that is a uh, very simple as an elementary in the elementary area for K to five. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Dr. Fisher, Tara Griffith. Hi, Tara. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for the um, way that you connected um, everything together so that teachers do not view this as one new thing or one additional thing, but yet still considering the student engagement in those practices that we discussed um, in the, the distance learning playbook, uh, tying it back into the clarity, the three questions so that we are still asking um, and very intentional in, in what students are learning and, and why, and then also tying it back into that, that critical piece of the self-assessment moving toward its students towards being uh, visible learners of their own uh, learning and the self-regulation piece. So just showing how everything is um, full circle and connected and not separate entities or, or the next thing down. Thank you, Tara. Okay, I end every one of these sessions that I do everything on distance learning. I always say this at the end, take care of yourself. You're worth the investment in you, whether that's a morning routine or an afternoon routine or a lunch, Zoom lunch with colleagues, whether it's a wellness plan, whatever it is, take care of you because you're worth the investment. Don't burn out. We need you. This profession needs you, your kids need you, and your families need you. Someday, one day, the students from this year are gonna come back to you. And they're gonna look you in the eye and they're gonna ask that question that every one of us loves to be asked. Do you remember me? Do you remember me? You were my teacher during COVID-19. You were my school principal during COVID-19. And I am who I am today because you did not give up on me. Teachers and leaders, thank you for everything you do every morning to make sure kids are learning. Thank you for your interest in our work, but more importantly, thank you for waking up and saying, I've got this, we're gonna make it work. Thank you teachers and leaders.
And thanks for the invitation again to come to Kentucky. <laughs> and Carrie, before you close this out, one thing everyone just to remind you of, that was a lot of great information tonight, kind of as just an overview of what we're going to go more in depth on. So one of the things we really encourage you to do, and we said this in kind of the video tutorial um, that we sent out, is even if for some reason you weren't able to complete the assignments by the time we have each month's synchronous meeting, please still attend those synchronous meetings. The conversations that you are able to have with colleagues around the state to really hear their ideas, to share your ideas and kind of problem solve together when we go into breakout rooms are invaluable. So we strongly recommend please attend those synchronous sessions because I think, you know, when we put our minds together, we come up with some great solutions to really tackle the challenges that we're facing right now. So Carrie, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Misty. And I just wanted to say to Dr. Fisher, thank you so much for your influence, for your impact, and more importantly, as always, for your inspiration. Um, every time we have an opportunity to hear from you, we're just so blessed. Um, and we appreciate your willingness to spend an afternoon with us. And just based on the comments in the chat, it's easy to see that you've inspired so many here today. So um, we just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everyone. And we hope to see you back for our synchronous meeting toward the end of the month. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.